All right. Welcome, guys. This is Peter Vug, founder of the prestigious Game Changers Academy. And thanks for tuning in to our monthly millionaire video series where we, we interview the world's most elite and successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, entertainers, and true game changers, people that I have massive respect for, and those who are making a huge difference, not just in their industries, but in the world. I'm excited for today's call because it's someone who has walked the walk for a very long time and someone who's making a massive difference in the world. Janice Bryant Howroyd, she calls herself JBH. I love that uh, initial, JBH. That's what I'm gonna call you for, for today. Um, okay. <laughs> she's the founder and chief executive officer of the Act One Group, a global leader providing customized cutting edge solutions in the human resources industry. The Act One Group is a multi billion dollar award winning international talent and talent technology enterprise with multiple divisions that each service unique areas of employment and provide talent management solutions. One of the top on the Forbes list uh, as America's one of the richest self-made women. In 2014, she was recognized by Black Enterprise as the first Black woman to own and operate a billion dollar company. She's also been appointed the U.S. Ambassador of Energy at the White House. But more importantly, as I've been studying her and diving into her stuff and researching, she's a people developer and she's an enabler of people. She wants to build people up and help them succeed, expand their capacity, and help them grow. And she's done that with thousands of employees. I think last time I checked, 17 or 18,000 customers. So uh, we are in for a treat. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, Peter, it's such a wonderful opportunity to talk with you. You know, I've studied you a little bit too, and you're developing people and you're developing opportunities, and that's really wonderful. So I'm quite happy to be here. I want to go back because, yes, I've studied you and you have a, a, an amazing past of how you are, who you are today. Like everything you've gone through, you've used as fuel, you've built amazing companies, you give back. Actually, we're going to talk about not giving back because you're still in the community. You're giving forward. Yeah. Um, but what are, I want to go back to who you were um, in your teenage years, early 20s, in terms of any tipping points you had that kind of catapulted you to where you are now. I want to start with your story growing up. Oh, wow. You want to make me cry and I'm in such a happy, happy mood, Peter. Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, in fairness to my true existence and my parents, my childhood was a very happy one. Retrospectively, I had incidental things that happened that dynamically impacted me and therefrom is where the tears come. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? 100%. And so growing up as one of, uh, of uh, 11 kids, um, I did not know we were poor, Peter, until I went to university. I've said this publicly before. My mom and dad were such great managers and they were such optimists. Now, what your, what your team of folks need to understand is that I grew up African, well, wait a minute. I wasn't African-American yet. I was, I think I was, I grew up, I was born colored. I became Negro. Then right before I graduated high school, I was black. When James Brown came out and said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, right? Everybody lifted a fist to that. And so that's the era of my growth. And I grew up in the deep South. So the environment that I grew up in was a very close one because I grew up in the, in the rural South. Uh, but it was also one that was very segregated. So even though we grew up much in a community nest, the same types of nests we try to create and what you're doing right now, you have a nest and a community going on. I grew up in something very similar to that in my hometown. However, it was a very segregated town. So if you think about the dichotomy of what I'm telling you, I grew up in the best of times and the worst of times. I had what people are looking for in terms of the close knit community, However, it was a segregated community, so it, uh, it, it really put me at opposite to opportunity. I had to leave home to gain opportunity. And our parents were so instrumental, Peter, in how I looked at the world and my siblings looked at the world because they kept us focused forward. And you said something earlier. You talked about me using everything for fuel. That is a gift that my parents gave me. They taught me to use it all on purpose. I remember mom saying to us often, don't let life happen to you, let it happen for you, you know? And that's about using all your stuff. 
and using it to your advantage. So, uh, so, so, so in a way, there was some Norman Rockwell going on, but there was a lot of, you know, men in white sheets as well. So when did you know in that miss of everything in terms of figuring yourself out, when do you know you had a knack for business? When did it turn into like, you know, I want to be a businesswoman? When, when did that come in play? Likely that was something that was underneath the gut for a minute, even though I grew up thinking I wanted to do social work. I don't know if you're familiar with the term social services, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that was actually a course of study when I was going to university. I knew I wanted to do social work and the business I'm in allows me to do that. Isn't that interesting that all these mm -hmm. years later, I actually get to do that. Uh, but the reason I say it was probably underneath the gut for me uh, all of my life because I had such strong women role models in my life. Now, mind you, we're talking about a small community, a segregated community. And so the majority of the people I knew and I saw every day, unless I looked at TV, were uh, African American, right? And my family was very industrious. My Aunt Sarah owned properties and she was a school teacher, but she really was a businesswoman. And my mom's mom was a businesswoman and her dad was a businessman. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial spirit and, an, and there was evidence of entrepreneurship around me. I identified that that was really what I wanted to do after I didn't get the job I wanted in LA all those years later. Interesting. So you didn't get the job you wanted. Do you feel like that was kind of a catapult to act one or was that later? Because I, I want to piece together the story. Oh, Peter, that was definitely the catapult to act one. When I came to LA, I came out on vacation to visit my sister, Sandy. Uh, Sandy and her husband, Tommy, were in the music industry. And I had come out thinking I'd be here for a couple of weeks and I'm still on that vacation, kid. <laughs> That's amazing. So tipping points, fast forward. I, I, I'm assuming your business ventures, Act One, now it's growing. Now, how, you have 2,000 employees or has it grown? You had 2,000? No, we've grown beyond 2,000 employees. We've got about 2,800 now. And then what about customers? Uh, we are probably around 21,000. So 21,000 customers. So I want to talk about the early stages because the stats I've studied, so many businesses, 90 something percent fail. And once they get to a million, less than five or 10% reach the 10 million mark. You're at the billion. Something has to be said about that. Multi-billion, multi-billion. Multi-billion, thank you. There's a difference. So what do you feel like separates you from 99.999% of the entrepreneurs or CEOs that start a business on how most people fail past a million? You went to multi-billion. Where is that disconnect? What do you really attribute that to if you have to look back? So if you look at it, each story is going to be unique. However, I do think you're on to it to ask, what's the academic difference? If you, can, if you can look at it and you can start to give people a formula. One of the things that I know worked for me is that I made sure I enjoyed the learning process. We have in our organization what we call a game day mindset, okay? So... Uh, as a matter of fact, we're doing a lot of culture work in our organization right now because the company we were, we ask ourselves, will what got me here get me there? And a lot of times when people reach the million dollar mark, or for others, it may be the 50 million, depending on what the product or service is. But the important thing is when they're ready to make that next level of growth, they think that doing more of what got them there got them here will get them there and it often won't and I think what made the difference for me I'm going to give you four things I think really made the difference for me Peter one I enjoy the work okay now I mentioned in our company we have something called the game day mindset now, game day mindset for us is you love the practice. You love the work that goes into it as much as you do the winning. Oftentimes, entrepreneurs get to a million dollars with themselves or one or two other people in their employ. And so they like building it up to a certain level. But once they have to stretch, once the business starts to demand they continue to learn more or compete differently, they get afraid, okay? The second thing for me is 
I learned very early on, don't ask of others what you're not prepared to do for yourself. Now, that's gonna sound contradictory with number three, hire people who know more about it than you do. But they tie in when you think about it, loving the work, loving the practice. You know, the great athletes are great because they love the practice as much as they love the game. You get what I'm saying? And so with number three, it's really important, okay, that you're hiring people who know more about it than you do yourself. And then number four is always value word of mouth business. Many people know how to sell their business oftentimes better than they do how to deliver their business, how to deliver on it. They can sit down and talk you into buying the thing, but then delivering becomes a, a, a challenge. And that's where my ABCs kick in. And you studied me, so you probably know I teach my ABCs. You know, ask the right questions, listen, listen for the right answers. Be where you say you'll be, when you say you'll be, how you say you'll be, how is most important. And then circular communication. You've got to stay connected. All of that is part of that number four. By the way, that's a formula for success growing beyond a million, growing beyond a billion. It also works quite well in your personal life. And I can see- Did I answer you well? 100%. And I can see, I was just thinking that's not just business, that's everything. Yeah. Life, relationship, family, friends. Let me, let me ask you this, uh, JBH. And, and I want to say something, Peter. Are we in a conversation? Because I'd love to really share something with you. Let's go deep. Right now, where we are in the world, and uh, many of your team may be in the U.S., they may not be in the U.S., but we're all looking at all of this political stuff around us, and many of us are engaged in it. We're all looking at the economy, and many of us are learning how to ride the economy. Others of us are learning how to, how to, how to manage it and rein the economy. Uh, there's just so much that's going on in our worlds today that we sometimes are relating differently to ourselves than when we give ourselves that quiet moment. There are two really important characteristics of winning beyond a million, okay? And I think it's really important, and people can debate me, oh, it's important before a million. No, you can really win to a million without it, but there are two things that are really important winning beyond a million. One, you've got to be deliberate about the quiet time you give yourself. And that quiet time is about the quality of it, not necessarily the quantity of it. And then the other thing that's really important, winning beyond a million, is you've got to value the people in your personal life. You've got to make sure they understand how they fit. A lot of your family members, a lot of your group, a lot of your, you, you, you know, your core team, your crew, are going to be there for you when you're building up to that million. By a million, whether you recognize it or not, you've become different in some ways. And while your core values may be intact, you may not be living along them. And it's really important to make sure you keep those two things intact. Know who you are individually on your own. Get the quiet time. Value the quiet time. And then make sure the people who are in your personal crew know who they are and how they fit. And sometimes they don't fit the same they, way they did when you started that business. And you've got to be honest and transparent about where the difference is. Really have to share that with you, Peter, if I'm going to bring my truth to you. Well, I've seen that <clears throat> evident in a lot of different people's lives that I've been a part of, including myself. So knowing these things at an age where they're just starting to build is such a valuable asset. I, I hope you guys comprehend and conceptualize what she's saying. Cause that's such a game changer. Most people don't have any deliberate quiet time till, till things are, they're struggling or their backs against the wall. They don't know why they lost their business. They, they have ruined relationships. So it's good to do this on the way up too. be quiet and, and understand how to not just place the right people in your life, but, let them know what you're doing. You value them. You're working hard for a specific purpose, for a vision, for a reason. So I love that because a lot of people ask me, Janice, they say, how do I explain to my, to my significant other, my wife, my husband, my brother, my friends, my mom, 
what I'm doing. They don't. Or your pet. Things. Understand for a lot of people that's your pet. And we laugh about it because it's cute, but it's true. Your pets are a big part of how you live as well. And you can often see yourself and where you are and how you're dealing with life through the reflection of your pet before you will a person because a person has the sophistication to cover it up that a pet won't allow you. Interesting. Interesting. That's a good perspective. So a lot of our students, and I'm, I'm, I'm piggybacking off the conversation because you talked about self-worth. Some of the hurdles I've seen with, with our students, with uh, our members in the academy and people that will watch this is getting to know their true self-worth and their true worth. As you grow your business, what are some important learning lessons that you've came across to develop and harness and be proud of your worth? Because I, I see this not just in business, but all over the place. People just aren't understanding the value of who they are. So how did you learn yours? Okay, there are a couple of things that I'm gonna share with you when we talk about worth. First, it's important to understand what you're worth to yourself may not be what you're worth to someone else in that moment. That does not devalue what you're worth to yourself, nor should it. So you've got to understand the art of negotiation and the art of compromise. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, you want to get your business out there, right? You've got this really incredible idea. Nobody's bought this next level idea from you. This next level idea or this next level thing is going to take you to a $5 million business. You've got to have somebody believe in that. I'm not talking simply pricing now, I'm talking worth. And oftentimes, I'm seeing a phone on, Peter. Are we still together? Yeah, we're good. Okay, oftentimes people will make the mistake, young entrepreneurs will make the mistake of seeing their worth as their price. Price and worth aren't the same thing. Sometimes you're going to price yourself differently to be able to express your worth. And you've got to be very thoughtful that if in pricing yourself, your business to someone, you're giving them an advantage, they need to know up front that that is an opportunity in the moment, but that they are going to pay a full price later if you're going to go that route. So that's really important. Know the difference between your price and your worth, okay? What you're worth to yourself may not be the price someone is willing to pay you in that moment. The second thing about worth is, it's really important that you don't undersell yourself to get that opportunity because everything is so transparent today and companies can share information in a way that once you set that baseline, you may be setting it too low and making it too steep a climb to get to where you really need to be. I see you nodding your head, so I'm thinking you're rolling with me on this. 100%. We're, we're in, a, in alignment with this. Now, one more thing about worth. What we are collectively is a much stronger value than what we are each separately. So when you value yourself, make sure you're setting the equation right about who else is in that formula for your worth. Sometimes it's going to surprise you because you've been undervaluing the person who's really doing some heavy lifting or some, 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 some incredible innovation for you. Or it may be the flip. You may think that that person who's talked the most on your team has done the most and they actually may not have. So you've got to know your team intimately. And I'm talking especially in those early days when your team is such a small team of people, you've really got to know each crew member very, very well. And don't be afraid to change positions. You know, if somebody started out in your team playing one position and you find as you grow, somebody else is better for that position and you've got to transfer team members, make sure you're doing that. As a matter of fact, some of the highest performing companies 
early in my business career did that on point. They, it was deliberate. Many companies would uh, dimming, they studied dimming. I don't know if you're familiar with dimming, but he tried to teach in America and we didn't listen. So he went to Asia, taught in Japan. Toyota learned a lot from dimming and brought a lot of those practices here. One of the things that companies did uh, very effectively was that they would switch executives from roles to roles every three or four years. They wanted them to know the whole business. They also didn't want them to get stagnant in the one vertical. And so as you're growing your business forward, uh, don't be afraid to allow people to play different positions on your team, you know? That reminds me, you said a quote that really stuck with me. You said, I don't believe the world was designed for us to have just singular success. I believe we individually fulfill ourselves best when we work. I believe you said work for community success and you have not created a company. I feel like studying you, you've created an actual movement, which is a big difference. So what do you mean by that where the world's not designed for us to have just singular success? Well, we see that every day. When people don't understand, and sometimes people are creating community success, but they really don't understand that they're doing it as well. Let me give you an example. Most people know who Elvis is, regardless of how old they are. Can we agree with that? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> okay, now Elvis died very sad. And Elvis died not feeling a lot of love. Yet Elvis was one of the most beloved people on the planet. How does that happen? It's when you're not connected enough to the people who are helping you create that success and the community impact you're making. So it's not always <coughs> coming from a negative place. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's my understanding Elvis was a very generous person, a loving person, songs that you know brought great positive emotion to people, but there was something inside that didn't connect to that, which is why I say, I take you back to that thing I told you that two really important, find that deliberate quiet space. There was never any deliberate quiet space there, you know, to really connect to who you are and how you are with other people. None of us succeed on our own. And I don't care who tells you they, oh, I'm self-made, you know? No, we all, in my community, we say we all stand on the shoulders of others, you know? Uh, people have different ways of phrasing that. The truth is, when you're building a company and the purpose of that company is to create success for others, then it becomes such an overwhelming success for yourself and you feel it and you enjoy it as a, at a different level. What's the first thing somebody wants to do once they signed a new contract? What do they want to do? They want to go tell somebody who it matters to them, right? It's going to be mom. It's going to be significant other. It's going to be somebody. It may be a hug and a kiss with a pet, but you want to share that success. And so I'm saying, make sure that it's a deliberate sharing. Make sure all of us is part of your formula. You're building an organization that measures your success, self as successful when these things have happened. And these things include the community efforts that you care about the individuals in your organization gaining what they want. In my company, I remember once we had a meeting, Peter, uh, several years ago, and some of my um, uh, executives were really excited and bragging about some new houses that they built, and one had bought a new a third home, and I was kind of feeling the flow for them a little bit, and then I thought, how many people report to you who own a home? who would like to own a home. And so I completely changed my conversation with my execs in that quarterly meeting. And I encouraged them, let's measure your success, not by the homes you own, but how many homes are you helping other people own? How many of you've actually asked the people who report to and up to you if they'd like to own a home and where they are in that process. And by the way, homeowners make great citizens. They keep the community clean. They have pride in their gardens. They create better opportunities for healthy food to be delivered to communities. You know, when you find homeowners, 
You find better quality grocery stores. You get what I'm saying? It's all a dynamic that individually sounds, oh, so petty, so little, where's she at with that? And it adds up dynamically to a much fuller whole. We are all so much more complete when we add the cumulative effort of ourselves than we individually measure ourselves one by one. That's, I had to learn that too, going in direct sales. That's such an important facet to understand about building a team. So thank you for sharing that. In terms of building your team and creating that culture, this is such an important principle because really getting to the next level and scaling your business, it takes training and hiring the right people that not just have the great culture, but also want to succeed as bad as you do. Um, your value is, is in your people. You want to be a people developer and you have been. Is there anything that you do that you can share on how you motivate the team or are you focused on hiring motivated people to where you just want to give them the best training and they take off? What's your philosophy on motivating, training, hiring to scale? There are different areas in our organization. So at different times and under diff different leadership, you're going to see combinations of that occur. One of the things I can tell you is that when I'm personally working with someone, I really love to get that green, raw, hungry talent that is open to learn as much as they can and very uh, encouraged to share that. You don't have to wait until you get there to share that. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I love that type of energy. There are places in my organization where you're just going to have to bring the skill and the talent before we can hone it for you. Now, that may be sometimes in the development of the technology versus the design of the technology, or it may be more in the accounting and some of the legal areas of our organization than in the sales or the development of programs in our organization. There is something that I want to share with you. And I feel as though I keep taking you into my classroom feeder. So forgive me for it. But there are two student. more things I student. want you to know. Keep going. Okay. I want you to know two things. We train and we teach. Know the difference. Teaching is occurring in the classroom. Teaching is deliberate. It's academic. And it does have a quality of teach and test to it. Training is what happens when you actually get in the game. If you're not getting in the game with your people, you're not training them. Now, you may have someone else who's getting in the game and they're training them. And by design, that can work very well for you. But you don't sit in a room and teach somebody something and then send them out and tell them to go do it and believe that's the sole formula for your success. With some people, that's going to work very well. But if you've not hired deliberately for that type talent, don't expect that type outcome. Make sense? 100%. Get in the trenches with them too. Yeah, you got to get out there with them. And you know what? There's so much that happens when you trench together. Number one, you get trust. Okay? So write it down. You get trust. Number two, you get result. Number three, you get evidence. Number four, you're getting a neighborhood, a community. When you trench with somebody, everybody's in that neighborhood. I've often heard people say when they went to Vietnam, they forgot whether they were black or white because that's where people were going to war during my age group. All they wanted to do was come home alive together. You know, a different thing happened when they got back. When they were in those trenches, it was a neighborhood, okay? Number five, you get a lot of communication and it's clear. Remember I talked in my ABCs about clear communication? Everybody who needed to know knew when you're in the trench, you make darn sure that everybody who needs to know something knows it because your buddy's on the same line bearers is, right? And then what is, the, what is the last one? You know where I'm going here, T-R-E-N-C-H. What's the last one, the H? You get home, you get home base, okay? Whatever home base is for you, you get there. So give it back to me. What did I tell you trenching gives you? T-R-E-N-C-H, what did I say? Trust, results, evidence, neighborhood and community, clear communication and getting to the outcome, home.
Right, you get to home base, yeah. And so when you trench with your people, that's what you're giving them and that's what you're getting back. Are you, are you following this thing with me now? Thousand percent. Okay, all right. It's really important to do that. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, measure their success different ways. For me, you didn't ask me this, but I guess by now it's evident to you. I measure my success by how much evidence I see of the growth of the people in my organization. Sometimes because you, and I, I really wanna share this because I don't know how much time we have and it's something on my heart and my head to share. And that is a lot of times when we start a business and we hire th those first few employees, we are a little reticent or afraid to allow those roles to change, the dynamics to change as that business grows. I would. By that, I mean, okay, we were homies. We went out on Friday night. We did the beer thing together. Or, you know, every Wednesday, we brought the pizza in and we did this together. And now the business has grown and there are 25 people. And all of a sudden, it becomes very difficult to keep that same dynamic with those first three or to grow that, that, that dynamic to those 25. You've got to remember you owe it to your employees to lead them. And there's a difference in leading and managing. We manage processes, we lead people. And those same three people who stay in your company deserve your leadership as your company grows, which means the dynamic of your relationship may change with them. Does that make sense for you? 100%. I, I wanna ask you this because I think this is important based on everything we've covered. Where do you see entrepreneurs mess up over and over again? when it comes to this type of uh, purpose and scale and team building, where do you see the common mistakes in your mentorship oftentimes, and training? Oftentimes I've seen it and let's be candid. I've seen it occur sometimes in my own organization and have to correct it because it doesn't always occur deliberately. Sometimes it occurs, you know, outside of one's intent. Uh, but oftentimes, Peter, the thing that I see people mess up in is they have that favorite few or they have that favorite person. For some reason, they just really get along with that employee. That team member really is, you know, in vibe with them. Well, your other team members are seeing that as well. And so creating that equity and opportunity, you may think you're doing a fair job of, you don't get the right to have favorites. You don't get the right to have the one you always sit beside in a meeting. You don't have the right to always give this one the opportunity because you know they're going to take it to home base. As a leader, you owe the organization and you owe the employees that everybody gets a shot at bringing it home. I love it. That's huge. Let's transition to technology as well because you've been a pioneer and you're, you value innovation. You've talked about it multiple times. A big part of entrepreneurship and success is, is embracing and thriving through change, which a lot of people can't handle how fast things are changing. Being a thought leader on human resources, what's your advice on how to harness the power of the new era? And let's say artificial intelligence, as that's upon us, how do you harness that and adapt and adjust versus most people trying to hold on to what they did 25 years ago and it's just not working anymore? How do you, how do you really embrace that? And I'm not going to argue with the people who actually did the nomer on it, the nomenclature on this. I do think that one of the biggest things going against artificial intelligence for a lot of people who don't really get into it, get around it, understand that it's been there anyway in our lives. We just not named it as such is in how we name it. Artificial intelligence, you know, a real love, fake love, right? Um, but I do think that if we can think of it as alternative intelligence, intelligence that enables us in an alternative way, people can get with it. Change is going to happen to you or it's going to happen for you. We talked a little bit about that earlier in our conversation today. And it particularly happens at a speed that you don't get to claim. What you do get to claim is where you get in, where you jump out, and where you get back in you don't have to stay on that spinning wheel in order to get to success. You've just got to know when to get on and when to get off. 
there's something called ways, right? And my executive aide loves to drive. And when she's driving, she loves to use this, uh, this, this intelligence called ways. And I suggested to her, you're never going to learn your way anywhere because ways is always going to take you the most direct or quickest way to get there, which is always changing. You know, traffic's always changing, right? Accident here, traffic jam here, whatever, you know, event at this corner. And so you never really learn your true north, south, east, west because you're always following ways. That's what I mean by use it and let it work for you, but don't let it happen to you. If you never actually get out there and learn on your own, it's gonna, it's gonna happen to you. You've gotta be able to mediate the two. So I don't think artificial intelligence has to be the threat to people, their businesses, their jobs, you know, their incomes in the way they see it. If they make sure that they understand where to get in, where to get out, and they don't let it happen to them because it's going to happen anyway. You know, you're doing and using things today, even with your enthusiastic approach to life, Peter, that you did not imagine eight years ago. You know, some of the biggest businesses around weren't really fully mature to where they deliver now, eight years ago. And that may want us to ask the question, how good is good and how big is big? you know, and how good is big, we may start to ask those questions, but on the matter of artificial intelligence, if we can just think of it as alternative intelligence, then it becomes another solution for us versus another challenge. Interesting. That's a good way to think about it. <clears throat> In terms of innovation and hiring and scaling and referral business, like you talked about, what I really want to hit on before we, we let you go, and I once again, thank you for your time. A couple more questions auditing your business. If someone's sitting here, they're making, they're doing 300K a year, 10 million a year, and, and they really want to scale up. You're sitting with them one-on-one. -on -one. You're walking through their numbers and their business. What is your thought process? What are you thinking about? Or what questions can they ask themselves right now to audit their business to figure out where they're at and what their next steps are? Tough question, but I know you can answer it. It's interesting though, because a young lady yesterday who had attended an event that I spoke at in Atlanta a year or so ago, uh, had asked if I could give her some time. And for whatever reason, she just had a compelling case for me to listen to her. And she, her question was, I want to scale globally. And I asked her when we, and this is a very intelligent woman who, by the way, her business is over the million dollar mark in, in, in opportunity. Uh, although less than half of it is in the area she really wants to lean in on. And so I asked her two questions. I asked her, why globally? You know, businesses are born globally today, okay? So it's just a geographic thing. Are you really talking global? Are you talking numbers? There's so much you gotta know in order to be able to expand your business. So the first thing to ask yourself is why? Why do you want to get there? Be very clear about why you want to get there. Why you want to get there doesn't change that you get there. It may change how you get there. It definitely should impact how you get there, okay? If you want to do it because you got kids and you want to be at a certain level by the time your kids are at a certain age, then how you get there may have some timelines on it that if you don't have kids and that's not a part of your equation for getting there, won't factor into how and when you get there. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The other thing that you want to look at is the strength of your team. You've got to SWAT your business. All of your crew know what SWATting is, yes? Mm -hmm. Strengths, weaknesses, yep. opportunities, and threats. A lot of people swat the business, but they don't swat themselves. When you swat the business, you're swatting the cumulative outcome and effort of everybody on the team. Step back and swat yourself as well. That's going to help you a lot, okay? Then this is really important, Peter. How many customers are repeat customers and how many of them do you have? When you're a small business, sometimes you've only got one or two customers. That's great. That's fine. But if you're talking about scaling, 
make sure you understand that scaling isn't just raising your numbers on your volume, it's also expanding the numbers and the breadth of customers you're servicing. You're no more secure than the best customer you have. And that may be your relationship to that customer, or that may be that customer's own relationship to their success. Let a customer hit a hard time, you've got, got only two, all of a sudden your business is halved. Am I making sense for you? 100%. Okay, now I'm hoping I'm making S-E-N-S-E -S and C-E-N-T-S as well. I'm assuming both, we, we have a lot of executors on the call. So the, the, they're the people that will take this and actually use it as well. But I just see a lot of people in that go, 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 go. And they never take a step back to, like you said, quiet time, deliberate, but also to audit their business of why do they want to go to the next level? And then who do they need? Not just why, but who do they need as well? So you, you've nailed that. In terms of, of your priorities, your scheduling, your time management, your focus. I know it's changed and it's different based on what stage you're at in your business, but how do you choose your priorities and what to take on and what to say no to? Because I see a huge problem in entrepreneurship, especially with millennials, JBH, is they say yes to too many things, then they're overextended and overwhelmed then they can't focus on the most important areas to grow their business and life. So how do and, you choose? And, and, and mom taught us early in life, one good yes overwhelms a thousand no's, okay? People are going to respect you for no a lot more than a yes that you ill deliver upon, okay? And, 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 and see, here's the thing. All of us have the same amount of time. It's how we use it that becomes important. You've got to weigh in deliberately on what's going to give you the result you want. Sometimes that means that I'm out talking and I'm speaking and I may not be getting the fee that I demand for that, but I'm getting an audience that's really going to take that message forward and deliver it in a way that is worth more than King's gold. You, you get what I'm saying? Or in my instance, Queens go. Um, and, 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 and so you've got to just be thoughtful about what is the return on the investment. And not always is that going to be the monetary return if it can dynamically put the message forward you want. Because if you put enough wood on the fire, you're going to get the heat. You get what I'm saying? And so I think learning how to qualify your yes and your no becomes really important early in life. Sometimes people are surprised and they say, oh, you mean you're really going to do this event or that event for them? Well, yes, I am. Because guess what? There are going to be about 50 millennials in that room and 25 of them have the same questions I had at their age and they don't have the contacts that they need. Then that's going to be powerful for me. And that may overwhelm an ask that may have paid me a fee that would be different than they are able to offer or may have put me in front of a different group of, uh, of, of opportunities. On the other hand, I may decline something because the opportunity to something else is better. Then other times, I just need that quiet time, that deliberate quiet time, and I'm going to say to no, no to everything in that moment or in that time span. Make sense, Peter? You said something that is, is such a powerful uh, tool. Qualify your yeses. I, I don't mm -hmm. see a lot of people qualifying their yeses. That's huge. Yeah. And, 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 you know, all of us want to go out and we want that S on our chest, right? You know, Superman, Superwoman, Superperson, wherever we are, we want to wear that S on our chest. The truth is when you're wearing an S on your chest, it's pulling you forward and it can lean you down, you know? And so you've got to learn to uh, uh, really value, value your time. Your time is one of your most valued currencies if you're thoughtful if you really understand what life is about i tell people your time and your vote are two of your strongest currencies invest your time well and study before you vote so that's my message 
I want to talk about this. Then I want to talk about your book, which is amazing, by the way. Um, I want to talk about your personal mantra because once again, in our industry, in our society, pe people are changing who they are. They're compromising their values for, for career, for money, for all kinds of their chameleons. They, they fit into different industries based on who they're around and their environment. You say never compromise who you are personally to become who you wish to be professionally. Can you please dive in on that? Because that message needs to be uh, yelled loud and clear to everybody. And it goes back to so much of what you and I have been talking about in this conversation, Peter. It's a blessing to me that you're asking me this question because I see so many people get midstream and they wonder what's it all for or how did I get here? Or um, I'm gonna be able to do so many mitzvahs and I'll make up for this thing I'm doing that I know is wrong going in. All of that is bad mouth, math. That's not real love, you know? You got to make sure that when you reach, because when you go in it, you go in it believing you're gonna be successful in the thing, you gotta make sure that being successful in the thing also supports you being successful as a person. And we see too often, we talked about Elvis, right? What greater success in his field did anybody have than Elvis? You can name the few. And by the way, when you start to name the few, you see oftentimes some of the same, what we call tragic outcome, right? Because they became successful at the thing and they left the person behind. And these are good people who had loving hearts, cared about folk, work hard to get there, knew right from wrong, served their country and their families honorably, but they lost themselves in the progression of winning the business. You've got to make sure that what matters to you, and it may be different for different people. All of us have a different place where we say stop and where we say go, but know where it is. That's why that deliberate quiet is so important. You can't know how to be uncompromising about the things that matter to you personally if you don't know yourself personally. You, you get what I'm saying? And, 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 and so, yes, never compromise who you are personally to become who you wish to be professionally because the win isn't in it. You will not win. You may be renowned. You may earn money. You may help a lot of other people truly win. There are a lot of companies with leadership where people are winning in that organization and the leader is rotting inside. So you may help other people win, but unless you understand who you are personally and you can be true to that person, then you may not win for yourself in that personal way. That's, that's huge. And, and that definitely hits home. Um, I have a question from one of our members, Christy. She says, and I see this prevalent too in a lot of industries and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, ideas. How do you stick with an idea um, for starting a business and, and, and go with it versus having so many ideas, but never executing or taking any action. And she also wants to know, how did you create an idea and then keep that idea through the negativity and all the challenges? Because I think that's something that's relevant. My, my answer for her may not be what she's actually gaming at. And I'm hoping I'm understanding her question clearly. Because here's the thing. We're such a kaleidoscopic people, right? That's one of the beauties of being human, is that we're just so kaleidoscopic. And we can handle more thought than we ever manage in a day. We can handle in a minute. You know, it's just where we stretch ourselves to. So on the idea of sticking with ideas, I would venture to say, know when an idea isn't working and when to build on how to make something move forward that does work for you. A lot of people value sticking with it. And I do believe that commitment is important and the ability to stay in it and stick through it has a value. But you again have to know what the it is, which in this instance is the idea. If the idea isn't strong enough to create its own light for you and you're truly doing and valuing all the things that you and I've talked about today, Peter, then that idea is going to stand up on its own. 
if it's not doing there, doing that, maybe the idea isn't at the right time, or maybe it's just a rotten idea. But a great idea does carry its own light if you're doing all the other things around it that will help it to shine. If, it's, if it ceases to shine or it negates to shine in the midst of doing the right things, let's be clear on whether it's really a great idea at all. And, right and way, because it's your idea doesn't mean it's a great business. Interesting. So when you say right things, execution, testing, the right team, uh, product development, all that kind of stuff, is that what you're saying? All of that kind of stuff, along with the work with yourself, who has to put the idea forward right? Sometimes it's good to work in companies that are doing some of the things you want to do and then build that shadow box. That shadow box is that thing that I'm working here right now, but over here, I'm shadowing my idea on how it would flow. And I'm actually building that shadow process to see and test it out. So I want to share your book because I feel like every single person in my academy and, and the hundreds of thousands that eventually see this need to read it because it's something not talked about enough. It, acting up, winning in business and life using down-home wisdom. It's great. It's business is tactical, but it's also how to find your leader, not losing yourself, which no one talks about. They're like, do anything you can to win. Do as much as you can to get results and money. They don't talk about the knowing yourself aspect, the keeping your roots aspect, so developing the leader inside you and really conquering the business world is what it talks about. But can you kind of share what you feel like makes your work and your book different than most out there and why people should check it out? And then again, my book may not be that different. Maybe my book is just important in a different way to people who need to hear it. And I think here are some of the things that have been said to me. I had the president of a major global company say to me, you know, I read your book because I was gonna be interviewing you. He was interviewing me on the stage at one of his company events, right? Fireside chat. And he said, I read your book and I bought 50 of them. And I told the people who are direct reports to me to read it. What do you think about that? And I said, well, if you got 50 direct reports, you got too many direct reports, but who am I to say that? Your business is bigger than mine, right? On the other hand, I asked, why did you want them to read it? And he said, because you're so honest and you give us real visuals about how to make the academic work. You make it real life. And so I think I may be sharing through my book, Acting Up, in a real way with people that they can relate to it and know it from a very honest, from a very transparent, and I think oftentimes practical manner. I think that may be the thing that people are honing into. I've also been told by several people, not just women, oddly enough, especially on campuses, I've been told by folks, uh, they like my book because they say, and they're calling me auntie. And I'm like, why are you calling me auntie? You know, I'm not old. And they're like, oh no, that's respect. That's love. That's respect, right? I'm like, I'll do with JVH. But they're telling me that they love the book because they say that, they feel trust because I'm telling them real stories about my life and how I've done things. They trust the message I'm giving. It doesn't feel as though I just talk with them from my head. I put my heart in it. And by the way, that's something that I hope all of your, all of your students in your academy will remember. If we say nothing else today, Peter, I think I really want your, your, your team, your crew to hear me say, make sure that the heart and the head are balanced as you continue to lead in life. Whether you're leading a business, whether you're leading an effort, whether you're just leading yourself along a path to find yourself, make sure you allow the heart and the head to be partners in the exercise. The head will tell you what to do. Please allow your heart to tell you how to do it. Thank you so much for all the wisdom, um, all you, the value you provided. And one of the biggest reasons why I respect you and have respected you was, yes, you have the results, the accolades. Yes, you've got all these awards, but 
you've stayed a world-class human being before anything else. And there's not a lot of that right now. So I, I appreciate you for that because all the people that want to be interviewed and want to come to the Academy, we say no to a lot of people because yes, they have the success, but like you said, they've kind of lost themselves and they've, they've left the world-class aspect of being a human being. So much respect for you, for the legacy you're continuing to build. Anything you need help with, I, I am there for you. I'm going to share your book. By the way, the word I think about when I hear your book, and it's in a couple of the reviews too, is just refreshing. It's refreshing oh. to read. Oh. Oh. So I appreciate your time. And, and anything else you want to share with, let's say you're in front of a thousand young entrepreneurs that are hungry, that need your wisdom. Any final words for them before they yeah. leave? Love this village we're all living in. Love this village we're all living in. If you lead with love, we're all going to win because something bad's happening over there or even happening in your own moment does not negate the value of the village. Take care of the village, honor the village. The village was here before we got here. The village will be here after we leave. Let's make it a better place. Let's do our work to ensure we make this village livable for a long time for a lot of people. Live in love. JBH, I appreciate you. I love your energy. I can't wait to meet you soon. Thank you so much. And uh, from everyone else, thank you. We appreciate you. And we will send you all of the, uh, the recordings. A lot of, we're going to uh, turn this into a lot of different cool content that we'll share with you. So thanks again. And I'm excited to share your message. Love you, Peter. Appreciate it. Okay. Have a good day. All right. You too, babe. Hey, what's up? Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoy this video and this content, make sure you hit the subscribe button below, put the notifications on, and I assure you, you'll love this content and these videos.